Hey everyone, thanks so much for coming to our Tell Me About It Tuesday News River Rising Paddle Recap. We're really excited um, to be here tonight and get to share some of our stories. My name is Samantha Crop. I am the News River Keeper on the Sound Rivers. And my name is Jill Howell. I am your Pamela Tar River Keeper with Sound Rivers. And um, yeah, we're, we're thrilled to be able to have the opportunity to share a bit about the journey that we just completed on the News River um, back last month. Tonight, we're really hoping to share with you all sort of an overview of logistically what we did, what the paddle actually looks like on the water, um, kind of a summary of the trip and highlights. But we also want to share um, some of the most beautiful things that we saw along the way. A lot of the issues, including water quality issues, pollution issues um, that we encountered that um, we made sure to document and track through our work as river keepers on the water. And logistical challenges, things that um, you know folks might uh, wonder about in terms of how we were able to get all of our gear together, um, how we were able to essentially make an 11 day journey and 150 mile journey on the water. Um, and then we want to end with talking about some takeaways. And so um, with kind of that as an outline, I will just jump into the first piece, which is a trip summary. Um, that's the next slide. So when we were first thinking about this trip, um, the New River Rising Paddle, we, you know, essentially had a few goals in mind. Um, Jill had done a paddle of her river. She'd done um, the Char and also Pamlico River on two separate trips. And so um, we knew that there's a lot of really great value in getting out onto the water and actually experiencing the river, each river mile um, in, you know, as close of a way as we possibly can. And so that was the first initial goal was basically getting to know the river intimately, um, really learning about all of the different stretches and turns um, and how the river changes from, um, you know, where we put in, in Smithfield all the way down to where we took out in New Bern. Um, also, though, we had a lot of other, you know, intentions along the way. We recognized that this year is the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. And so in sort of celebrating and recognizing the uh, real importance of that act and the history of everything that's happened in water quality um, improvement since then, we wanted to sort of highlight that progress um, and also all of the work that's yet to be done um, that we still have to do through our work as river keepers, through our work as people who care about rivers, um, you know, whoever you may be. And then the other big important piece is that this year, uh, the Noose River was named by American Rivers uh, as River of the Year, which is a huge honor. Um, and this paddle um, while we were planning, you know, a, a wonderful trip on the News River to sort of experience and learn more about it, we also had this amazing opportunity to conjoin that experience with a celebration, um, and a celebration of basically how unique um, and special the News River really is, um, and again, how much progress has been made um, on the News River and improving water quality and engaging communities on the river, um, and also all of the things that we're still working on as river keepers. And so that was really um, what we were going into this paddle intending to do. Um, the name News River Rising was uh, something that came about after a lot of thinking through um, what we really felt this paddle meant to us and what we wanted to communicate to those who live and rely around the news. Um, and really for us, it means a couple things. One is that communities we want to see along the News River rising up and participating and becoming active members in protecting and being a part of the river. And so we think about, you know, news river communities rising up and working together to continue protecting the river. Um, we also were, of course, thinking about climate change and how um, the river levels are rising. Water um, weather is becoming extremely variable and extreme. And it wasn't, uh, it, it was a coincidence, um, but it really fit the name and the title of our paddle that Hurricane Ian happened to happen, really raising the water levels, really, um, rising up the river during our paddle. So that's kind of the history of why we decided to do this in the first place um, and what we were going into it hoping to do um, along that 11 day trip. Go to the next slide, Jeff. Just the, the breakdown, I guess, of the trip itself. So we started in Smithfield 
and we took out in New Bern. It was about 150 miles um, and it was an 11 day trip. So every night we were camping basically where we pulled out of the water um, at a variety of different locations, including boat ramps, some which were great and some which I would never camp at again. Um, campsites, like legitimate campsites along the river. Um, we stayed one night on one of our members' lawns in a stretch where there wasn't a whole lot of access or camping options. Um, and then during the hurricane, we actually got off the river and stayed on land at an Airbnb. Um, but for the majority of the trip, it was three humans. So it was Sam, myself, and uh, Emily, who is the Rogue River Keeper out of Oregon. She came out for the trip. And then uh, I have two dogs. Um, each of our dogs rode in the front of our kayaks. And we had a variety of people also join us for a day or a couple days. Um, and then the map on the right. So this is how we went about mapping it out from the beginning. Um, each different colored segment is about five miles of river. And then along the way, we put pins for where we could potentially camp um, or where we could potentially stop um, for like a lunch break or um, along the river where there was a either beautiful feature or a known pollution issue. Um, and that's kind of how we crafted and planned for all the logistics of an 150 mile 11 day paddle. I hope that you all appreciate Jill's map as much as I do because it was uh, pretty masterful the way she put that together. And I wish that you all could zoom in and see each of the pieces. Um, but we really did put a lot of energy and time into pulling that together um, planning wise. Um, and I want to, we had a kind of an ongoing joke during the paddle. Um, Emily and Joe would laugh because at me because every day I just said, it's so beautiful, another beautiful day on the Neuse River. Um, and so I get to talk about all the beautiful parts, um, because honestly, um, you know, as your Neuse River Keeper, I have loved this river since I've known it, um, but I also recognize that there's a lot of issues on it, and I didn't expect for it to be just as beautiful as it was. Um, it really floored all of us, just, um, you know, every step of the way, every, um, every part of the journey, every chapter, um, and it was different. And so some of the highlights to all of us, I think, um, were certainly the first stretch. We were really excited to be putting in at Smithfield and paddling that first stretch um, down to Goldsboro, where there's about 30 river miles um, that are colloquially known as the let loans. Uh, they used to be so full of um, stills and snakes that people said, that area is better left alone. Um, and still, it's uh, thankfully a lot of it's been protected. There's a lot of it in conservation trust. Um, the state of North Carolina actually just bought out a chunk along the river in the Brogdon Bottomlands. And it's just 30 miles of essentially undeveloped river. And in that area, uh, we saw a lot of wildlife. We heard coyotes, we saw wild hogs, we saw um, a marmot, I think it was, some kind of rodent that we were unable to identify from the kayak. Um, but a lot of wildlife and it was incredibly spectacular um, and that night we camped on a sandbar and it was basically like being um you know on this incredible beach um just in the middle of the noose and another highlight of course Cliffs of the noose if you haven't been out to Cliffs of the noose state park i highly recommend it An incredible formation right on the noose river it's a huge state park there's a lot of hiking trails um, and it was really, really fun to be able to spend some time in there. And that's just uh, past Goldsboro, just before you get to the town of Seven Springs, um, a really great gem of a place. And you can go and um, stay in Seven Springs afterward, which was one of our favorite stops along the way as well. Other highlights. We have, you know, getting further down from the um, low-lying kind of mixed uh, pine and hardwood forest down into the swamp. There was even different kinds of beauty. We got into Kinston, the water levels uh, started to drop a little bit again. This was after the hurricane had kind of, uh, the rains had kind of already started to come in and pass and it felt, it felt incredibly swampy. The water started moving slower. Uh, suddenly we were in Cypress uh, swamp and 
the colors uh, were incredible and the reflections on the placid river. Um, you can see in the picture, it just, it looked like we were looking into glass, into mirrors, reflecting the sky and the trees. And um, again, every day, just a different kind of beauty. Um, that night, I think the first night in Kinston, uh, Emily said that she heard catfish slapping around in the river all night, um, just, you know, jumping around and just, again, tons of wildlife. And then we got into New Bern, getting closer to New Bern. Uh, we start getting into the saltier waters, more brackish. Um, again, the river got much wider. We started seeing swamp lilies um, and it started to feel more like we were getting close to the estuary and just, again, gorgeous, spectacular every single step of the way. And I can't forget the very last thing. Um, I wouldn't be able to talk about the beauty of the trip if I wasn't mentioning the sunrise and the sunset. We were lucky enough the last few nights to um, get to spend a sunset paddling on the water. Um, and the colors and the views uh, were just spectacular. Also the sounds of the birds uh, and just incredible peace. I should say, you know, we only saw one other kayaker the entire time, which was a big bummer. We think more people should be out there enjoying the river. Um, it was quiet and it was incredibly peaceful. It felt so remote. Um, but yeah, um, can't say enough. The Noose River is a very beautiful place. So Sam got to talk about how beautiful the river was and I'm about to bum everybody out with all of the pollution issues that we that we saw and that we identified along the way. Um, so Sam mentioned part of the the journey was to get to know the river um, and really just see all of it um, or see a, a good chunk of it in, in one shot. Um, and part of that was to identify some of the pollution issues that are a concern in the watershed um, and see what they look like from the river and just how bad the impacts are. So as we went along, uh, Sam was documenting what she saw to be able to follow up on when we got back to the office. So one of the major issues that we saw really the whole way, um, but is an issue especially in the upper part of the New River watershed, were sediment and erosion concerns. So the picture on the left is from Sam's new least favorite place, Busco Beach. It's the giant ATV park. Um, which for the most part looked pretty good and had their riparian buffers. Uh, and then there were notable exceptions like this mud pit here, that the mud pit is the river, that's the Noose River, um, and sort of riding these, these <laughs> bikes and stuff into the water uh, really tore things up and caused significant sedimentation. Um, and then there's another picture of that again to the right. We're used to seeing it mostly from basically irresponsible development, development that is happening in places where it shouldn't be and not proper, following proper sediment and erosion control measures. Um, so when land is cleared too close to the river and the right controls are not put into place uh, to prevent sediment from running off, um, all of that loose soil will just end up in the river. So your banks are eroded, you're losing portions of your property and also you're causing really turbid waters here. Uh, sedimentation like this uh, prevents sunlight from getting down to the bottom of the river. Um, it can have impacts on, on like wildlife habitat and fish species and things like that. Um, so this is a problem and one that we saw really a lot along the way. Kind of a, a big catch-all um, pollution issue on the noose are a number of industries. So a major one that we came across first was Duke Energy. Um, they store their coal ash, which is the byproduct that you get after you burn coal to generate electricity. They store their coal ash in pits along the river. And there's a, a plant, HF Lee, in Goldsboro. Um, the coal ash from ponds there has spilled previously into the Noose River during hurricanes. Um, so we passed by this site and this location. Um, we also passed by uh, other industries like, like paper mills um, and kind of like big single industries that have a single discharge pipe and are causing potential impacts to the river if they're not operating properly or if they are flooded during a, a hurricane event. Um, the picture on the left is of Sam collecting a sample for PFAS. Um, so as part of a, a couple different projects with 
uh, other water keepers, we've started collecting PFAS samples uh, throughout the, the watersheds. And PFAS are man-made, we call them forever chemicals. They are made to be super tough and they don't break down very easily. So once they're in the environment, they're there pretty permanently. And they're in a whole lot of things. A lot of different industries produce them um, and they're in so many different basically household items, things like rain jackets or in your nonstick pans, um, basically coatings that are stick resistant or fireproofing resistant, um, usually have PFAS in them. So we stopped outside of the Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in Goldsboro so that Sam could get a sample from, from right downstream of there. These photos are not from the actual journey, which was good, um, but we passed by a number of CAFOs along the way. There was really only one day that we smelled that an actual CAFO, um, which was sort of surprising to me and a positive thing. Um, but there are a number of CAFOs within the New River watershed, and there are also some that uh, are too close uh, and have flooded multiple times during um, hurricane events. Uh, we passed by just downstream of Seven Springs. There's a facility, the lagoons have flooded multiple times during major hurricane events. So all of that waste has ended up in the Neuse River. Um, and then the photo from the right is a recent spill at a biogas facility, um, not on the Neuse River, but it's adjacent to Nahunta Swamp, which flows into Contentnia Creek, which flows into the Neuse River. So we stopped and paused for a moment on our paddle uh, at the confluence of Contentnia Creek and the Neuse River to flag that these spills that happen upstream on smaller creeks from CAFOs um, do ultimately impact waters that people are recreating in. Sam, I'll turn it back over to you. Um, sure. All of the all of the the issues that we identified, things like offers that were cleared improperly, or um, you know potential violations. Sam like has taken those and and gone on to follow up with the relevant agencies and things. Um, but it was good to see, you know, like all of the challenges and what they look like from on the water and just have a better context of, of what we're talking about, um, having seen it from, from out on the river. Yeah, the list of to-dos was definitely not shortened from that trip. Um, but again, a lot of the stuff that Jill mentioned, um, we, especially, you know, with buffers and sediment issues, we wouldn't have been able to see unless we were on the water. And so encountering those things, being able to get that PFAS sample at a site that was as close to where we thought a pollution issue was happening as we could get, having our eyes on the water the whole way felt invaluable for our work as river keepers. Um, so while the to-do list grew, it was a really good thing that it did. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about challenges that we faced along the way. I think a lot of people who are interested in the journey are not only interested in the stories, um, but also some of the things that might, you know, might show um, difficulty, some challenges, some obstacles, um, if others wanted to go and do something like this. And so I get to talk about some funny ones that we encountered early on. Um, one of the first ones that we encountered, um, I think this was the second day of the trip, uh, before uh, the storm was mud, uh, basically lots and lots of mud. Um, we obviously um, needed to do um, a lot of stopping along the way, and one of the reasons we had to stop was to get water drops. We did not treat the water and drink the water from the Neuse River. There's um, mostly because we know, you know what's in it, and we know that um, there's some pollutants that we didn't feel comfortable trying to treat out with our own camping gear. And so we were working with folks who were great supporters to provide water drops along the way of clean water. Um, and one of those water drops, we had to kind of scramble up a steep bank that was covered in mud. And I ended up sinking down almost to my knees in mud, losing one of my Crocs, uh, having to dig that out of a mud pit. I thought I was going down in the quicksand. Um, and then my dog, Charlie Girl, of course, also got covered in mud, and then we both got back in the kayak covered in mud, and we were just covered in mud, um, and that was the mud day. Um, but there was a lot of that along the way, and just the swamp itself, especially as we started getting down to Kinston, the um, river started to get slower, and um, 
more swampy in nature, there were very few places for us to stop and have lunch. And so the picture on the bottom right is me eating, um, I believe that was carrot cake that was gifted to us and it was delicious. Um, but just kind of in a strange swampy little sandbar out of um, a styrofoam container with, it was just a whole, um, a whole ridiculous scene, but there was no getting out of the kayak at that moment. I had to kind of stay in there because we were dealing with swamp. And so that was one thing that we didn't really think all the way through was those weird times where maybe you have to use the bathroom, maybe you need to get your water, maybe you need to have lunch and there's really nowhere to stop. And so um, we did a lot of kind of coming together and creating a raft between the three of our kayaks. We did a lot of um, just kind of posting up in swampy areas and laughing really hard about how silly it all was. Um, that was a fun challenge. So another challenge was packing. 11 days is a long time, and we did have some support along the way. Uh, we had a lot of dinners provided to us, which was super nice. Um, and we had water drops, but pretty much everything else we took with us, all the food, all the supplies, everything. Um, so it's just very difficult to, to figure out what is necessary and what is not. Um, and then really every morning we set out with the best intentions of leaving early. And I knew that, that that may not be the case based on my past experiences with these trips. It takes just so much time in the morning to pack up, um, 10 days worth of gear because everything has to come up at night and then everything has to go back in. Um, so honestly, one of the most exhausting and challenging things I think of the whole trip is, is figuring out what to bring, packing it every morning, um, and trying to stay somewhat organized. Sam, I don't know if you have any thoughts about, about this. This, the, the picture on the left is Sam repacking. We had a, a night off the river due to Ian pretty early on in the trip. So we took that as an opportunity to empty everything out and repack. Um, but yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna add the anecdote about, you know, so it is a lot to every single morning pack back up every single evening you're done paddling after a long day and you're unpacking and sometimes you just misplace things and sometimes um you know mistakes happen where you don't know where the keys are to the lock that connects all of your kayaks together and sometimes though you plan to leave early because you have to paddle 25 miles in one day you only find that all of your kayaks are stuck together and you don't have the key this happened to us um but thankfully our wonderful friend kelsey with knee deep adventures was there to save us by essentially dismantling the boats and putting them back together um in very fast uh form so impressive but yeah stuff happens unexpected weird stuff um just kind of gotta laugh about it and keep going Bill lost the keys. That was my bad. I don't know where they are. We never found them. Um, so packing's hard. It's hard to keep track of everything. Um, the weather. So uh, the weather was challenging. Uh, we can always, I was always expecting for there to be some type of, of rain over the course of 11 days. Um, but we were not anticipating a storm. We were able to sort of watch it creep up on us and we had a plan in place to get off the water, um, which we ultimately did, but the weather this time was especially tricky, knowing whether or not to even leave in the first place, um, or if we were going to leave, were we gonna have service to be able to continue to check on the weather, or was the weather gonna be so bad throughout the, the basins that we shouldn't get on in the first place because we'd wanna be doing sort of response to the storm as river keepers. Um, ultimately, we obviously decided to go, uh, and the storm was sort of a pain uh, to logistically get off of the river and everything, um, but it actually helped us afterwards. The water was super low when we started and we needed a little bit of help with flow and also just getting around some of the fallen trees and stuff. Um, so the rain actually helped us, but the weather is, is sort of always a challenge for something, something like this. 
And the dogs. So the dogs make for great content and they're very cute in their little boats. Um, and they were actually very good when they were inside of the kayaks. Those dogs just napped and lounged in the sun for six, seven, eight, nine hours a day. And the moment they got out of the boats, they were nightmares and would run off and uh, just do whatever they wanted along the sandbars or the swamps or whatever. Um, and so they would, after being cooped up in a boat, they would uh, go running off sometimes too, too far. Um, so the dogs were a challenge, um, but everybody survived. The dogs were great. Um, it helps that we had an extra human. Uh, I think the, the dog to human ratio, there should always be more than one person than there are dogs on a big trip like this. Um, but it is possible to bring them. Sam and I were both in tandem kayaks, so the dogs had plenty of room to like be in there and have their own space. Um, one other thing with the dogs that I hadn't thought about, because the only other time Miller and I had done this was for a significantly shorter period of time, but they require a lot of their own gear and food and supplies. So the dogs start to add a lot of weight to the kayaks, both with themselves and the stuff they need. Um, but I think like would do it again with Charlie and Miller. Um, now they're pros, so I think it worked out. There was once that the dogs decided to run away and swam across the river, and then another time where they ran halfway to Kinston uh, in the FEMA by Outlands in the forest, and I chased them maybe a mile. Um, Obviously, all ended well, but challenges still worth it. Um, takeaways. This is kind of the last piece. Um, I don't know, Jill, if you want to jump back in and go and go first with a couple of your initial takeaways. Um, but I think we sort of in in um, wanting to structure this this sharing time, we wanted to kind of give highlights, issues, um, things that we encountered, but there are, we talked a lot about this kind of amongst ourselves, what we left feeling, the lessons that we learned, the big things that we're sort of walking away from that journey, um, holding close to our hearts. Um, and I think, you know, just to share one off the cuff and then I'll pass it back to Joe, but I think the big one, and I mentioned this earlier, um, is that the News River is really worth exploring, um, not just the river itself, but there are tons of places, tributaries that come into the river along the way, um, kind of magical little side swamps and um, very beautiful, clean, tannic waters that were really luring us in. There, I have filled my map with pins of places that I plan to visit in the future on the river, and it is it looks even wilder than Jill's map that she made uh, planning our journey. There's a lot on there. Um, and we only saw, like I mentioned, one kayaker um, along the entire time. And that's unbelievable um, to me. I, I think that the lesson, um, one, one of my big takeaways is, um, you know, there are plenty of opportunities for getting out on the news, even if it's for a couple hours or an hour or a day, or two days or 11 days um, or however long you want. Um, and it's really accessible. Um, despite the swampiness, there's a lot of ways to get out there. So that's one of my takeaways. Yeah, I guess some of my takeaways, so I have done a similar journey now down the Tar and the Pamlico. Um, and for me, I had not spent much time on the Noose River at all. And I was super struck by just how similar the tar and the noose are, just in how they look and how they change over the course of, of the area they run through um, from kind of like a, 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 I don't know, through the Piedmont coming through as, as a river with, with um, you know, some flow and fresh water and everything that surrounds that, and then turning into a more brackish estuary ecosystem kind of in the same area. Um, it to me just like makes sense of why we work on both of these places, the, the places themselves, the issues that are impacting them, how they, how they just like are ecologically is super similar. Um, so that was really, I don't know, striking to me. And, and 
I guess, interesting for me to learn about this whole ecosystem that I haven't really experienced at all. Um, and then the other takeaway, and Sam, I'm sure you're going to talk a little bit about this too, but uh, just the people along the way, so nice. Um, we found that, like, you know, people who have a relationship with the river, who have grown up around it, who see it as this invaluable resource for them, whether they fish in it or um, live alongside it. Um, it's people really love the Noose River and uh, were awesome about kind of like helping us along this journey as we experienced it for ourselves. Um, and that presented itself in a whole number of different ways, whether it was providing gear or meals um, or a place to stay. Um, it's just awesome to be met with people uh, along the way who may only have the river in common with you, but that's like plenty and enough and super important. Um, so Sam, I don't know if you want to say anything more about that and also sort of the thank yous to everybody, but um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, I think that's a perfect segue on that note. Um, just like going into the journey, we didn't really know um, how glorious the river itself was going to be. We didn't realize how many friends we were going to make along the way. And like Jill said, just every step of the way, folks were so welcoming um, and supportive. And it would have been a lot different of a journey if we didn't have the kind of support that we did. And some of those folks um, have been supporters of Sound Rivers for a very long time, and others um, are new in our world. And we're so thankful for all of them. Um, so our next slide is sort of a thank you. Um, it is a thank you to all of the amazing people who helped along the way. Um, we enumerated all of those folks in our blog on the last day um, but just to say we um, were sheltered by some folks on their property um, we were lended kayaks we were pulled out of a muddy boat ramp saved from hurricane ian we were um, accompanied on the water we were given beer um, by supporters um, in kinston who run a brewery mother earth shout out and we were um, fed an amazing fish fry on the side of the river after a 23 mile paddle journey day and more. Um, so you know who you are, um, some of you are pictured here, others are not, but we are incredibly grateful for the support that we have received. And um, not only that, but it really is to me um, a part of one of the reasons why the News River is so beautiful because of all the people who live alongside it, who rely on it, who care about it and who show up for it in big and small ways. So thank you to all of you. Um, and just in closing, um, and then I'll, I can pass back to Jill for any last things before we open up to questions. But um, I would just sort of say in summary, um, I think we all gained, and I even, you know, speaking for Emily too, coming from the Rogue, um, we all talked about the value in river keepers sort of getting together and sharing knowledge and getting our eyes um, in our in ourselves in place in the place that we work for and it was an incredible experience um, and I think walking away from it as your news river keeper I feel like I can do a better job doing that work caring for the river and standing up for the people who rely on it so I'm looking forward to to more of this more adventure and um, all the work yet ahead I have nothing to add that's a great a great end to the presentation and I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we can check the chat for questions but while we're doing that if anybody has anything they want to ask us about the trip what we saw how we did it um, feel free to either raise your hand or just come off of mute Hi, I'm Susan Kettles, and um, I have a lot of questions, actually. Uh, the first one, I uh, heard about this particular uh, presentation from uh, Friends of Mountains to Sea uh, uh, post on their blog. Anyways, uh, so what, how would I find your blog? and read about it. So I am hoping that Vale is gonna put it in the chat also, but um, you can definitely go to soundrivers.org 
um, and we have the blogs all up there and uh, we have more photos on our Facebook page, which is Sound Rivers NC, I think. Okay. Um, we'll what see. is a river keeper? Oh, good question. Sam, go ahead. You want to take? Sure. And just um, I threw the link in the chat to um, the over the, the big page with all of the individual day by day blog posts. And it's not only writing; it's um videos we took a lot of videos on the water and photos um so that's where you can find that um what is a river keeper i love this question i've learned um how to answer it in a number of different ways depending on if i'm um trying to be funny and cute or not but basically i think um my favorite answer is you know people always ask me what am i keeping out there and i think um I'm keeping first of all the health of the river i'm keeping the river in people's hearts making sure people care about it um which you know I think is is both true, um, and I think to be more specific about what that means, keeping the river healthy, keeping the river in people's hearts, it means that we are essentially monitoring. Um, we're the watchdogs and we're the advocates for the river and the people who rely on it. We use a lot of different tools. We um, you know sometimes are educators and we're talking to folks like tonight. Uh, we show up in schools. We talk to community groups, organizations. Um, and sometimes we are advocates, we're working on policy, we're trying to um, do better in terms of regulations, strength and protections um, in actual rules. Um, sometimes we're scientists, we're actually out in the field collecting water samples. Um, sometimes we're, um, you know, detectives, we're doing flyovers, we're digging around in the Department of Environmental Quality's old document files, trying to find information from forever ago, we're researching. Um, and, you know, all, all of those things are in our wheelhouse. Um, and so we basically use all the tools that we have to make sure that the rivers are cleaned up where they need to be cleaned up, protected into the future for everyone who wants to enjoy them. Do all rivers? have a river keeper? Unfortunately not, but North Carolina has the most river keepers of any state in the country. So we're doing pretty good. Are there 15 of us, Jill? Is that right? Ish. <laughs> uh, how would I uh, have access to your map? So we've actually, this is another, we've gotten this request a couple times now. Um, I think, so right now it has like some of our own kind of like notes about issues and things like that. Um, but we had talked about cleaning it up a little bit and marking the places that, or sharing it so that places where we know you can camp and just other spots like that. And also just having the mileage is super helpful. Um, but we can think about getting that up on our website in a shareable way. Um, the other resource that I recommend if you are a paddler is Paddling Eastern NC by Paul Ferguson. It helped us a lot for planning for this paddle. It's helped me in other paddles. Um, but yeah, that map, we can think about getting that up on our website to share because you know the first person to ask. Um, and while while I sort of wrap up that question, there's a couple in the chat. Um, one was about swimming. I swam one afternoon very briefly, like at a lunch stop. The weather was really weird. Um, some days it was super hot, some days it was not. I took one quick swim. Sam, I don't know if you swam. The dogs did enough swimming for everybody, though, for sure. Yeah, I was actually, you know, I didn't, I thought that I might not swim because I, I thought maybe I would not want to be in the water in all the places, but actually, I really did want to swim a lot more than I did. It, there was so many places along the way that were really, really inviting, um, and I definitely would swim there, but like Jill said, the weather was weird, um, and we we're on a mission for a lot of it. We were really rolling. We were trying to get miles 
Um, so we didn't have too much time, you know, before it got um, to the evening time to get in. But people ask me now if they if I would swim in the noose. My answer is always yes, absolutely. And it depends on where and when, which I think I want to give a plug for one of our amazing programs, which is Swim Guide. Um, Sound Rivers is a part of an international program that samples um, all of the areas that people um, swim in along the Neuse River, and we also do the Tar Pam um, for E. coli bacteria. And we publish that information on a weekly basis all um, during the swim season in the summer. And we actually are um, this year for the first time doing year-round sampling and um, data in a number of locations on the Neuse and Tar Pam. And so. Um, to answer the other piece about are there any swimming beaches along the way, there's a lot of places that people do swim. Some of them are official, some of them are unofficial. Um, we try to sample and get information out about the you know, safety levels of swimming in all the places that we think people like to swim. That said, if you are a person who likes to go in these rivers in a certain place that we don't sample, let us know. Um, we want to know about where people are enjoying the river because um, a lot of people do get in the news and um, yeah, I, I think I'm, I would be one of them too. There's, a, there's another question. Um, did you find paddling challenging in places with either because it's shallow, windy, waves, or snags? Um, there was the first two days were, were pretty shallow, um, like about a foot of water in places. And it, if it was any lower, it would have been pretty impassable. Um, so it was slightly challenging. Like we got caught up a couple times on logs, uh, like trying to get over the logs and the water was too shallow. Um, so that was a little challenging, but not terrible. We never had to portage. Um, I don't think we ever really had to like even get out of the boats and, and drag them through the super shallow waters. For the most part, we were okay with water depth. Um, there was a couple windy spots, but not really. Um, the last day coming into New Bern, we pulled out at, uh, was it Glenburn Park instead of Lawson Park, in part because of the weather and the wind. Um, that last stretch was the windiest as the river widened up there, but we were paddling in it for such a short amount of time, it wasn't that bad. Um, so we took out really before the worst of that. But yeah, I think the most challenging thing, honestly, was was taking out all of the gear and like dragging our gear and our boats at the end of the day, rather than like the paddling. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts, Sam. I think um, just to add two challenges that were unforeseen on my end. One was um, as we got to New Bern, there was definitely a lot more motor boats. And that was great to see that there's more people out in the water. Also, not everyone slows down when they uh, go past kayakers. And so that was one thing I wrote about in one of the blogs is um, just kind of a public service announcement that if you are operating a motorboat, which Sound Rivers, we have, we're the proud owner of motorboats too. And um, we think they're great um, and very useful. Um, but to remember that people who are on kayaks um, and paddle boards, easily flippable, the wake is a big deal, um, especially when it's big wake. So slowing down, um, being slow and friendly. Um, that was a lesson that we learned after getting kicked around pretty good really early in the morning on that last day um, paddling into New Bern. Um, and then the other one that I, um, I guess I did expect it and I expected it to be a much hotter than it was, but most of the time we had great weather and then there was a couple of days, maybe one day in particular where it was really, really hot. And I remembered the safety, um, you know, it's, it's, it's important to think about safety in terms of heat too, because when you've got the sun coming down and the water reflecting the sun back up into your face, we looked pretty funny. We were wearing, I mean, we were pretty good. All of us were wearing, you know, long sleeve shirts, long pants, hats that go all the way around. I had a buff up on my face, protecting my face, hilarious glasses that went around my face. And it was because the sun was extreme. And if I didn't do that, then I would have been sunburnt and out of the game for the rest of the trip. So um, that was something that in the future I'll think more about is just really got to be safe from the sun if you want to be on the river all day. That's it for questions in the chat. So if anybody wants to, to ask, you can come off mute. And if not, um, fail. I don't know if there's any final announcements, if there's any information about the next Tell Me About It Tuesday or if we're on pause during the holiday season. Um, 
I'm just trying to stall for a moment to give anybody one last chance for questions before we wrap up. We are on pause in December, and I guess actually it's November right now, so there would only be one more of these. So we're on pause for December. There is though one exciting event on December 1st that is relevant to this conversation, which is an event at um, Noose River Brewing in Raleigh, where we're going to be simultaneously celebrating Noose River of the Year um, and doing another sort of retelling similar to this, but actually in person and with beer of the Noose River Rising Paddle. And so we'll have more pictures, more stories, um, and it'll all be in person. Um, and we'll have info about that on our website and you'll be getting it in our e-news too, but that's December 1st, mark your calendars. It'll be evening time at Noose River Brewing in Raleigh. So I think with that, uh, we will wrap up tonight. Thank you everybody for coming um, and listening to us talk about our paddle and the recap of it. Um, if you did not follow along on the journey while we were out there, um, the link to our um, our blog and our, our, I guess, additional photos posted on social media, you can find those either in the chat or on our website. Um, and we will see you all after the new year. Oh, one other thing. Uh, the, the auction for this weekend is our oyster roast. Um, and we are having an auction, a silent auction. Uh, it's online, so if you're not attending our oyster roast, you can bid on auction items. Um, we have some really cool auction items, everything from pieces of art and pottery to like some pretty cool trips and getaways. Um, so check that out. And I think that's it before I forget any other events or things. I think we'll call it for the night. Um, so thank you everybody for coming. Thank you all so much. See you out there.